Good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Scherze, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar focused on the therapeutic uses and effects of prescription drugs for both students and professionals. This webinar is also focused on the brand new textbook of this topic that's written by authors Tammy Lee Demler and Jackie Rhodes. So at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Tammy Lee Demler. Go ahead, Tammy. Thanks, Jen, and thanks everybody for joining us today. I understand that we'll have others joining us, so I thought it would be nice if we just started out the, the conference call with a little bit about the editors and authors of, of the book that hopefully you'll be buying and, and using in your curriculum. Um, I wanted to just speak first, but I will mention to you that um, Jackie Rose, my co-editor, is in trail status, and she's listening in on a conference phone right now as she's driving, so um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, learn a little bit more from her later, but I'm going to speak on her behalf. So I am Tammy Lee Demler. I am um, a, a doctor of pharmacy, I'm a clinical pharmacist in the New York State Office of Mental Health. Uh, I have a clinical practice over in the Buffalo Psychiatric Center, um, but I also have academic appointments across the country, which has really allowed for um, a very diverse geographic depiction of what this book hopefully will provide to you. I, um, I have faculty appointments not only at the pharmacy schools in the local area, but I also have a faculty appointment in Florida um, and in the medical schools and universities here in, in Western New York. I have a Master's of Business and Administration as well, and I'm board certified in psychiatric practice, although our patients that we treat have wide, various medical illnesses, and so that keeps us really truly uh, engaged in all things that are relative. Uh, one of the additional components of my portfolio that I think should be of interest to you is that I also am a residency program director for a PGY-1, which is a first year grad postgraduate, and PGY-2 specialist program um, for our upcoming um, clinical pharmacists. That said, I've had the opportunity to do um, surveys across the country in different hospitals and engage further with experts that we've included in this textbook to um, really, really enhance the wealth of knowledge and um, usable information from across the not only geographic area, but also the context of the rich expertise that they present um, to them. I have also been involved in teaching the pharmacy technicians. Um, I help write board exam and competency exam questions uh, for people who are, you know, involved in, in medication management as well. So, Jackie, I will tell you, she has a wide, wide degree of, of wealth and information and a huge amount of clinical practice experience. And I'll just tell you that although our PowerPoint slide was very brief in our faculty appointments, I can tell you that Jackie's had number, numerous programs director appointments at different academic institutions. She is very focused on caring for underserved populations. She's a nurse practitioner and has been at a number of different hospitals in Texas, Louisiana, and Georgia. She's just hugely talented, um, both acute and primary care. And um, really, she's been in the U.S. Army Reserve for almost 30 years. So um, again, a lot of degree of, of information coming from her experience. She's also well published, and she has had a number of excellent awards um, demonstrating her contribution to nursing practice. So it's been a great interprofessional um, project for us both. And with that said, I'm going to just launch into why we think this is the most amazing text you'll ever see. So about the text, one of the things that I have learned over the course of my experience, and I've been in practice now, uh, I hate to say it, 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 25 years, if not more, uh, makes me feel old. but I have a lot of good experience to share with you, is that the, the demand and expectation for getting quick information has become more important than any time ever before when we're, all of us are bombarded with new drugs coming to market and still we're sort of in this world of having to use old drugs too and knowing all of those and how they, they kind of play, with, play into each other. So this textbook was really written to be at a glance efficient and reliable the information that we provided has been screened as the most important information that you would need to know about any particular drug, um, and we've represented the majority of medications available in, in the U.S. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't include medications that were only available in other countries because that really doesn't help our, you know, United States practitioners, but the um, information that you're getting is really what you need to know. If you only had a second to look, it needs to know. And I will talk a little bit more later about the fact that sometimes 
we want to come back and learn a little more. So that first at a glance, one minute look will help me make sure that my patient is safe and that I'm doing the right thing. But I can come back and see symbols that will drive further learning and kind of a guided exploration into exactly what you're going to be looking for. So it does address the needs of faculty members and what they're looking for specifically about medication. So who is the target audience? I had to reduce the bullets to just the most efficient bullets here, but I'll tell you that practitioners who are out there already practicing, regardless of the number of years, looking for a reference to go to. Um, you know, I know that many times we are looking at a, you know, you know, looking at an electronic, you know, reference, and that's great, but it's overwhelming and often not prioritized. So, you know, for example, this can be a quick at a glance go to reference for those already out there looking for information. It's great for students. I, I express, you know, kind of a, a focus on nursing students because this is obviously a nursing text, but I've already had pharmacy students getting this book and using it as a guide for them as they begin going down that medication management pathway for expertise. And I've had doctors ask for it too. So the fact that it just says, you know, nursing practice doesn't mean it's limited to just to nurses as well. I wanted to mention that faculty, and as a, as a teacher myself, as an academician, I'm always looking for ways of being able to describe medication in a way that's meaningful for students. You know, starting out as a very non-threatening level because medications are, pharmacotherapy is a very, very daunting topic. And most of everybody that I've run into, regardless of practice, feels as though wow, I don't think I really got enough of that in my curriculum. You know, I would love to be able to continue learning. We have to all understand that we're all, we are all on a journey of lifetime learning. And even creating this textbook, I, I was really um, happy to know that I was learning even additional things about medications that I don't use all that much. Um, you know, psychiatry is my thing, but the medical management, all these new drugs, new diabetic interventions, it's all there for you. So faculty who have any kind of medication-related curriculum can use pieces of this, and we'll show you a little bit more about how you can um, in a little bit. So its organization as well is very unique, and when we were trying to create a, a unique product, um, my first thought was we need to organize this medication information in a way that's most digestible and most easy to kind of understand. Other textbooks might base their drug information based on a body system. So let's say, for example, um, you wanted to talk perhaps about purely cardiovascular medications. And so only in that chapter would be perhaps something that had to do with cardiovascular indications. We used instead um, American Hospital Formulary System, which is the, the basic element of providing formulary organization to structure for hospitals and, and other healthcare facilities that might use um, formulary basis for categorization. The categories that we have here are 14 chapters, and it cross-references where other medications, or let me just say, where a medication, although it's categorized as, a, for example, an antihistamine, how that drug could also be used for anxiety, so to speak. That would be just one example. So. I'll pull out just one example. Hydroxazine is an antihistamine, and its primary categorization is an antihistamine. So in the antihistamine chapter, you'll be able to know all about hydroxazine, and you'll also know that there's another additional chapter that this is referenced in. So you can go to that chapter, and you can also see, well, wow, that's really an interesting point, that this drug can be used for a lot of different things. Um, so. 14 chapters primarily categorized based on its AHFS therapeutic category. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how the chapter narrative fits with this. But the, the categorization you have to hopefully understand is really very unique, and it's going to really help drive understanding why the drug works. Um, and I think if I, I'll come back to it if I don't have that narrative, but um, let's see what the next slide says, because those are your chapters, all 14 representing most of every drug available. So the chapter layout, um, when, you, when you get this textbook, you're going to have, for example, chapter one, we'll go back to antihistamines. 
you're going to see a narrative depiction of why this drug works where it does. So we, we don't get too far out into the weeds where we're, you know, having more or less opinion or algorithm that's current right now. We're really saying that, you know, antihistamines work because of this particular receptor with this particular neurotransmitter so that the student or the adult learner who's already in practice can understand why these drugs really work this way. And the reason that we do this is because older drugs often find themselves back into the into the current status of, of practice. So we may see something that becomes, I don't want to say obsolete, but it's still available on the market. Sometimes they, they create a new spin or a new indication and those drugs come back. So you still want to learn why those particular drugs work and how they work. So each expert that we've chosen for these chapters, and again, across the geographic depiction, and we'll talk about who we've got where um, doing what, they are able to really represent that with the degree of um, simplicity, but, but, but also enough sophistication so that you can take that to a student with a degree of formality. So we have the narrative description about body system and where applicable, where it can be cross-referenced to others. One of our favorite parts of this um, book, I will say, is tips from the field. So while the narrative chapter is written by a primary author and editor who are, you know, highly qualified in that area, Jackie and I come in at the end of each chapter and we speak with our own voice of practice and our experience from our particular um, wealth of knowledge or a practice setting experience. And we'll give you just a few bullets that after you've read the chapter, you can be able to say, ah, okay, I know how to use this in a real world way. You know, if you're not a person perhaps that deals with chemotherapy, you can still flip to the back of our chapter, of, of our cha anti-neoplastic chapter, and look to see the real world take home that can be really applicable for people perhaps that aren't prescribing the medicine, but maybe even have loved ones who are in, you know, in the midst of treatment. So you can use it as a family member as well. And I, I think that that's very helpful. Again, perspective, you know, we offer a little bit of an opinion, but for the most part, it's just a statement of fact that would be um, reliable and um, uh, usable throughout the course of, of your practice. Another unique feature is that with the narrative chapter, at the end of each chapter, we have every single drug that is listed in that therapeutic category in a drug grid. And the drug grid is really nice and clean. Um, I've often taken a, just a quick photocopy of a page if I'm going to speak to students so that I have just the bullets. It's bullet formatted and you have the drug name, where it's available in brand name still. We also have indicated the, um, and I'll show you the page, but I just want to speak to this first, is the usual indications by the FDA. So while there are sometimes drugs with 20 FDA approved indications, where that's the case, we take the most common. And then we also give where, where we should, you know, examples of dosing. So we'll drag over to one of the FDA approved indications and we'll say, this is the oral, parenteral, um, in cases where there's a wide range of different doses, we'll say illustrative, so that you can quickly look and see what a normal dose should be. Again, not overwhelmed with 15 different choices. You can kind of at a glance know that, oh, 50 milligrams of this drug is what I should be looking at, not five or 500. So in that way, uh, we feel as though that's going to help reduce any chance of, you know, error by just, you know, people kind of guessing as to what, what, what range of dosing is appropriate. We also have included in there the most critical precautions and clinical pearls. And um, we'll talk about symbols next, but just know that the precautions are listed from, you know, perspective of what you would absolutely need to know. And we'll see a little bit about those. We have symbols that are, are driving that additional learning. So where there is a black box warning, there will be a black box. And for the most majority of drugs, the black box will then be linked to the narrative pearl that says associated with the need for additional monitoring or avoidance in this particular population. So the black box warning is listed usually in the words. You already are going to know what it means. But in some cases, drugs have a number of black box warnings. So any drug with a black box warning, when you're looking at that particular drug grid element, you should go back and look and, and make sure that you understand, you know, what the black box really was for that specific drug. We have specific dosing where the FDA has approved 
dosing specifically for older adults or specifically for children, and again, this is FDA approved, it will say a symbol of, of pediatric or geriatric with kind of a G, D or a PD, and that will mean that you, if you want to know those doses, will be then, you know, um, it will be recommended that you go explore that further. If you don't clutter up the box of grid information with the additional dosing because that can sometimes be misleading and lead to error if you're looking for a usual adult dose. And we do also include some pharmacodynamic warnings, such as QTC. We take the um, potential for Torsad very seriously, and now medications, when they're combined, have a concomitant cumulative risk of that QTC prolonging effect. So we have a symbol there for people who might be focused on that. But if you're not, it really doesn't, it doesn't clutter it up. And so you can, you can kind of just go right over the QTC warning if you're not looking at that specifically. This is the overview and the design, I have to just say, um, you know, we created the, the concept, but Jones and Bartlett made it beautiful. And the symbols here describe to you um, a little bit more about what they look like. So you can see that the triangle means renal impairment, that a dose adjustment is recommended. So if in the presence of organ function decline, the FDA has recommended a dose adjustment. Hepatic, same way. If you have somebody who might have um, liver dysfunction or um, problem with, with, their, with their function in general with liver, um, dose adjustments are, are recommended. Again, we don't clutter up the grid with that additional information. We just provide it as a warning to you. Now, many practitioners will say, well, I, you know, if in doubt, I always go with a lower dose. That's fine. But at least you'll know that the FDA recommended a lower dose and that it's not just based on clinical judgment alone. Um, so that's helpful. The black box you can see as well. QTC is a little heart, but that means that it may affect heart rhythm or it may increase the risk of having a, an arrhythmia. Beers list, I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that where there's a beers list drug or it meets the criteria for either a past inclusion or it looks like it's going to potentially be on a future beers list, we have added a beers list warning. So it's helpful for your older adults, for people who may not have used beers list before. Um, Dr. Beers was a, um, a very progressive advocate for an older adult patients. And the beers list is not just about having people being at increased risk of falls. The beers list really has a lot of different nuances to it. So um, if you haven't had a chance to really digest the beers list and know it, at least in this book you'll be able to know what is a beers list criteria drug, whereby you'd want to look, if you have an older adult, that maybe this isn't the best thing for them and there might be additional alternatives. Again, the FDA approved pediatric doses and geriatric doses. Not to say that, you know, people use, you know, people may use drugs in an off-label form for older adults or for younger adults, but this will help you understand where there is FDA-approved dosing available. And because of the complexity of having many drugs listed in different body systems, we have included a body system drug whereby if you see um, the little blue body in the drug grid and, um, and sometimes in the narrative text as well, it will say to you, okay, this is a drug, like Tammy Lee was talking about, that is also in another section. So I'm going to go take a peek at where else this is available. Uh, I, I did want to mention, and it may come, come up later, that we created a master index, alphabetical, regardless of what system the drug is in, where you can actually refer to the, um, the areas where these drugs are. So if you're looking up, let's say, quetiapine, you can look up quetiapine and know, okay, that's chapter seven and be able to get right there, um, both in the drug grid and in the narrative section. And you will see in the context of overall design as well, universal prescribing alerts. And we included these to declutter the grid so that anything that would be below, for example, where it says universal prescribing alerts, anything that falls below that would be also inclusive of those warnings so that when you're reading your grid, you can know, oh, right, so that universal prescribing alert it, it relates to this drug as well. So you're not reading the same thing over and over. We took out the redundancy so that you can focus on the new information that you're, you're gaining knowledge about. Um, and this is just a snapshot from our Chapter 7 Central Nervous System Agents. Um, it, you know, you can probably see that on your own, but it talks about much of what I've already described um, earlier. 
And then as you see, you'll see the next section, analgesic and antipyretic agents, and then their universal prescribing alerts that deal with those next drugs. Continuation text design, you can see here how nice and clean and decluttered this looks. Um, for example, this is again from Chapter 7, and it, it, the drug for amphetamine, for example, gives you the FDA-approved indications. Um, sometimes if it's a specific formulation, we'll add it. So for example, immediate release only. Adult dosage range, illustrative oral dose for ADHD, because there may be a wide range of options. Um, gives you examples of maximum daily dose. Very simple and clean, you can see it. Precautions and clinical pearls, again, you can see that we kept them very limited and everything above that applies as well. But the black box warning for this, if you can see, the black box would be connected to that association with, um, and it, the black box is really the contraindication for patients with any kind of substance abuse, including um, alcoholism. So that black box, you should take that very seriously and weighing your decisions to prescribe. It may not preclude you're needing to use this for that patient population. But with the black box philosophy, it's the FDA's most stringent warning to you as to this is really something you need to look at, however clinical judgment prevails um, when you're considering the whole patient. So the learning objectives and the overall um, kind of philosophy of learning is based on learning objectives, of course. So you're going to see that you're going to be identifying the pharmacologic agent. You're going to be looking at how to recommend optimal pharmacologic intervention, which is really the key to, to this whole, our whole plan of, of medication safety. And then be able to provide specific patient counseling points and, you know, in comes the tips from the field for medication management. There are key terms, so if you're looking for something really quick, you can kind of buzz through the key terms, see if it's there. But what we really like to say is that the section summaries that we've included, not only with tips from the field, but incorporating also um, kind of the case studies and conclusions that we've incorporated. So to be able to test knowledge, some good questions about the medications themselves where you can actually select an answer and then the, the author will share with you why that answer was right or wrong. So the take home at every end of this uh, chapter section is really helpful and can be further used, you know, for your own classroom. You can change it up a little bit, maybe change, you know, the the, um, the detail of the case, because they're case-based, but the conclusion is really the anchor and what we hope that you will take away. Um, there are additional multiple choice questions and sub supplemental PowerPoint slides, and I'll tell you what, the, the PowerPoint slides, if I only had those five or ten years ago to help me prepare my classes, because I've already used those in many different ways for different, different levels. I've actually used my um, PowerPoint slides for my technicians who are incoming technicians for pharmacy who really knew nothing about medication as a study guide for them. And I've used them also for medical residents who are coming to our site for, for training here. So I have been able to tailor these to be able to make the difficulty level what I want it to be and the take home to be what I needed for them as a student. So again, why did we write this book? I, it was interesting, the conversations I've had with Jackie about kind of the philosophical uh, advantage and edge that we, we had in our you know, intellectual property minds when we came to this project was it's even better now on paper because we kept you know, tweaking it a little bit, kept thinking about, well, what do we really want to do? But it's the provider demand for simplification and for goodness sake, the providers out there, the practitioners, the people prescribing and using medications, we need we need accurate and we need key messages and we need to keep them simple because there's an overload of information. How many people have ever heard of or have experienced for themselves alert fatigue? Um, if you are involved in any kind of medication management where you see drug interactions, um, too much information because it doesn't prioritize it for you. So you're seeing things come in that look maybe really scary but clinically really aren't, and then you're missing the really important clinical scary stuff because you're distracted by those other less, lesser levels of warning. So um, we've really tried to provide just the a right amount of information with the ability to just focus on key messages. And also very nice is that this book is not specifically focused on in any specific area of expertise. A generalist is really the person that this text was written for, however, as I mentioned before, that the experts in these areas of therapeutics have written these narrative sections, and 
have reviewed these drug grids for the most important part. So you're getting experts in those specific areas speaking to you through these chapters. I mentioned earlier that electronic databases are great, um, but that they provide too much information and they're not prioritized. And that in some cases with other textbooks, we have found that um, the content is, is sort of, I don't wanna say, um, it's influenced, I think that's a good word. It's influenced by algorithms and sometimes opinions, consensus guidelines that change. And while we all need to be practicing within guidelines that are evidence-based, we, we all know that those change over time. That's why we have a JNC-8, you know, DSM-5. You know, we think things will change over time, but the drugs that are available to you will not. So this information that we provided in this textbook is completely transferable to whatever guideline you're talking about. Um, and again, while we have we've imparted some degree of guideline um, discussion, we we do not influence how you prescribe specifically in that manner. We are telling you how the drugs work and what you need to know about each drug. Um, and algorithms again are are sometimes helpful in some cases, but in many cases those become obsolete, outdated, and then you, you're stuck with old information that really doesn't help you. Um, and the one thing I'll mention too before we get to the next slide is that a lot of the textbooks out there omit drugs that are still in use, but that are not necessarily in the guidelines. So um, if you, you know, we're looking at something, for example, uh, antidepressants, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they're way low on the guidelines now because of this newer agents out there that are, are more um, palatable, safer, patients, you know, tolerate them better. But boy, if you have a patient on a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, you need to know about those drugs and finding information on, on drugs that seemingly are not in great amount of use but are still in use is precious. So we're very proud to be able to say we will focus on not only the new drugs, but also we'll make sure that you understand the old drugs because they're still out there. I talked to you a little bit about prescribers and training, and um, I would say, and I would argue and advocate for, we're all kind of still in training as new stuff comes to market. My students, when they uh, leave rotation with me or when they graduate, I'll say, this is the first step into the first day of your own self-directed learning because you, we, we can become obsolete in so quick of time. Here in this medication textbook, you'll be able to keep up with everything as, as it becomes available in the market. Um, you know, we'll be showing you the electronic part of this as well, um, which should help stimulate further learning. But just know that we're all somewhat always in training, and, and that's, it's good for students and for people who are out there. We talked about decluttering and the way we really, really focused on everything we included in this textbook, especially when it came to the drug grids, we really had to filter. Is this important enough to add clutter or do we need to keep it out? And we, that was how we got to the universal prescribing alerts is we decluttered everything but left that all still available to you. And again, self-directed learning. You know, you may not feel like looking at a renal adjustment today because you're not, you're not dealing with somebody who has a renal issue. But it, you'll know that that symbol means you need to go back in case somebody that comes to your clinic is in need of a renal adjustment. So, Again, it doesn't matter for today, but you know it's there and you can go back to it tomorrow. And again, the case studies were all very, very real life uh, for many of us and writing up the case studies and, and my having a chance along with Jackie to review all the case studies, we learned, we learned so much and we're reminded of, of the things that really mattered even in the terms of, of drugs that we don't use that commonly. Again, this is sort of redundant, but this is a better depiction of this symbol and um, you know, as I said before, keep in mind, guidelines change and older drugs seem to find their way back. One of the examples that I use is um, doxepin, which is an antidepressant. It's a tricyclic antidepressant. And what, as we've had newer antidepressants come to market, doxepin just really wasn't something people used anymore. Well, lo and behold, doxepin now has become Silenor, which is a, in, a medication for insomnia. So uh, it's back, back in a new form. But in our book, you can just uh, take a peek back if you, you know, if they've reformulated it, you'll, you'll have it available to you. So again, we, we do not omit old drugs. This is a depiction of the tips from the field. So you can kind of see, you, this is just one example. 
pearls, the things to worry about, and it's all by bullet. So you can just run your finger down and see what might be of interest to you. And um, we use symbols to drive that as well, like a light bulb, kind of a, oh my gosh, that's right, I should remember to do this when I have somebody who's on an inhaler or is taking an antibiotic. And again, reminding people that the illustrative doses are so helpful to be able to say, I don't have time to read 50 different dosing regimens and options, but I can look to see what's a generally acceptable regimen for patients who are on this medication. So again, very helpful. What I'd like to be able to boast a little bit about is my, I'm so proud, and I know Jackie is so proud too, of, of the authors, the editors, the, re, the nurse reviewers that were involved in this. Uh, the symbols are certainly feedback right away from, uh, from people who have this book already was that the symbols made the content feel less intimidating, it was less, less scary. Um, the prescribing alerts also make sure that you're not missing the key points. So when students, you know, ask, I always say, go back to the universal prescribing alerts and just make sure that you understand all of those because those are really relevant for every drug we spoke about. And again, the experts in the field are sharing their insights and field experiences with you. And here, this is just a picture of my editor for Chapter 7 that um, we were able to, to talk him into doing this. He is actually the president of the College of Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists. I just was with him in April and I brought him a copy of the textbook and uh, just, you know, people, people who would impart their knowledge from their practice is really so valuable. And I think at the next slide, we have some additional contributors. The contributors to the overall um, intensity of this book, which is the comprehensive degree of depth is amazing. You can see that many of these people are, um, are from Buffalo, but many of them also are from different areas such as Texas. Um, we have Ohio. Um, I can talk about these people all day. We have, you know, again, Texas there as well. These people are not only clinical pharmacists, but many of them are involved in residency training. Um, the people on this, on this editorial board, I have a pharmacist who's also a physician, Claudia Lee, amazing uh, amounts of information for her um, being brought to this book as well. I will mention as well, because we're limited with time, that um, there were a lot of student contributors to this, uh, nurses and uh, pharmacy people who were who assisted in, in being able to provide some of the drug grid information. Here we have a lot of people, you know, for example, Jeff Lombardo, who is our anti-neoplastic um, uh, expert involved in all of this research and education. We have Florida represented. I'm sure that if you're listening in or watching today, you'll see somebody perhaps locally close to you. Um, but again, all of these people um, happy to be part of this interprofessional educational project. I would be remiss to say that um, we also had this hugely talented panel of reviewers representing nursing. So um, while the pharmacists on the flip side created a lot of the content, um, Jackie and I have sharing that interprofessional relationship that we have. Jackie's the nurse, I'm the pharmacist. We also have these great reviewers. So. Um, this project took a lot of time and a lot of intensity in terms of being able to verify accuracy and uh, applicability. So accurate is one thing, but applicability is the other element of it that you would want in a textbook like this. Okay, so why instructors will want to adopt this? The, the content of this book will always be relevant. As I mentioned to you before, um, you know, future, future editions of this will continue to add new drugs. But the other texts that are out there offering drug information omit the old stuff. So um, there's always a lag when new drugs come to market. You know, we're certainly going to keep up with that. But the old drugs are not, they're not taken out until they're off the market. So you, you will get um, almost everything in there that you would expect it. Uh, so instructors can do specific things. Like I said before, the slide template, I've already manipulated mine at least for three different levels of classes. And then again, the bullets and tips from the field are included in there for you, so you don't have to worry. All right, and then the teaching tips here. Um, so we can focus on the content in different ways, targeting drugs, why certain agents work. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about the critical black box warnings and adjustments when needed. Again, today you may need the adjustments, tomorrow you may not. The FDA approved geriatric and pediatric dosing. Again, it's not a pediatric textbook, but it is one that'll allow you to know if there's a dose that's recommended for children. And it can introduce very basic pharmacokinetic and dynamic concepts. We, we understand that that word pharmacokinetic and dynamic can elicit fear in the hearts of almost everybody who's not a pharmacokineticist. 
but we try to add pieces of it so that you can prescribe medications and use medications safely without any kind of fear of, um, you know, missing that key element. But drug interactions, it, we, didn't, we did not bog this text down with giving you all the options for drug interactions, but we do note where there is necessary dose adjustment or avoidance of certain combinations, that at least you will know that that drug is probably something you need to look more deeply into. Um, and hopefully not to alienate anybody who fears the topic, but we'll introduce them slowly to that concept. I think actually this might be where um, we're going to have Courtney do the demo. So I'm going to let Jen take me off of host and turn it over to Courtney. Great. Thanks, thanks so much, Tammy. Tammy. Oh, go ahead, Courtney. While I'm waiting for the um, control of the WebEx, I just wanted to do a quick introduction of who I am and my team that's available for our educators. So I direct a team called the Solutions Analyst, and we are a primary resource for educators who decide to use our digital products in the classroom at different levels, whatever is the most comfortable for you. So we have something that's called Navigate2, which is an online learning management system. And it gives us the ability to upload all of the instructor resources that aligns with the text into a platform, our learning management platform, where you have the ability to share all of the resources across multiple geographies with your students. So um, it's based on the Moodle 2.7 platform. And it does fully integrate with both Blackboard and Canvas. So if you are using that at your institution, you do have the ability to do a single sign-on integration, so you can still take advantage of these fantastic resources that we've set up for you. So you'll see here that I've got the uh, online learning management system login, so I'll flip right over to the digital resources. So what we've done is we've taken all of those digital resources and uploaded them into an online learning classroom for you. We give you that foundation where you then have the ability to customize all of those resources to really fit your teaching styles. So while we have a standard layout, you have the ability to customize them. So if you want to move the chapters around according to your course syllabus, you have the ability to do that. You can also add your own resources just by dragging and dropping them into the placards or chapters where they relate. So it's very flexible and very customizable. We've also taken the time to build out and feature the interactive lectures. This is a wonderful resource for you in the classroom for those that um, want to really flip the classroom model a little bit more and provide more resources to the students online. So you can see we have all of these interactive lectures embedded inside of the learning management system. Wonderful, wonderful resource. There's also knowledge check questions that are embedded into the interactive lectures, which allow the students to commit that information to long-term memory. In addition, you'll also notice we've added quite a few other instructor resources that Tammy's already mentioned. For example, the very valuable case studies that are available to utilize in the classroom. What you could do is you could set them up as a discussion forum by using that content directly. As I mentioned, it's very customizable, and it does share a common core feature set with most learning management systems, for example, like Blackboard and Canvas. So you can create your own assignments and assessments directly into the platform and then assign them out to the students. There is a full grade book, fully functioning grade book that is also customizable, and you can align it to, again, your course syllabus and grading styles. Navigate2 is also mobile ready, so users can use this on a tablet or PC or Mac, whichever device they have available to them. It also features an interactive ebook, which you'll notice I just flipped over to. It is also mobile ready. And we have a, a mobile app available for free. It's called the Navigate eReader. When the users download the Navigate eReader, it allows the students to take the ebook offline and utilize that at their convenience. Like most ebooks, students have the ability to take notes. 
and audio notes, which is a three-minute clip. They can also embed links inside of their copy of the ebook, take highlights, which is pretty standard. It's also fully indexed. So if I wanted to search on a key term here, I could search on key term and do some cross-referencing if I wanted to. So I can search for that key term, and it'll list all of the instances that that term is displayed in the chapter, and then you'll notice they're all highlighted in the textbook. Students also have the ability to print off up to two pages at one time, including their customizations. And if they're doing these activities offline, once they get back in the realm of uh, Wi-Fi signal, they can select Save and Sync and push all of that data up to you as the educator so you can see where they're focusing their attention on, which chapters are most relevant to them. So you can get some really great information on their level of engagement. You as the educator also have the ability to customize the ebook as well by offering notes and audio notes and then sharing those along with your students. Our next versions of the ebook will also include EPUB 3. Navigate 2 is also accessibly friendly. So we've really worked a lot on making sure that this meets those accessibility requirements. We partnered up with a user interface expert that really specializes in accessibility. Also, as Jen mentioned earlier on in the presentation, all of the Navigate 2 resources that are embedded into your learning management system, which you have the ability to customize, it's available as a free resource with the purchase of every textbook, which is a nice offering. So you can really take advantage of that. There's no additional cost for the institution. And then we also have a reduced price for digital only. If the students prefer just the digital resources, that's also available separately. I did want to quickly mention that we do offer these demos in a more in-depth presentation where we really focus on the assessments, the online assessments, creating forums and assignments. And we can certainly do that for you and your institution at your convenience. If you contact your representative, your sales representative, we can set that up for you. In addition, after you've decided to use the technology in the classroom, we'd love to spend some time to offer some training to you. We're here as an instructor resource so that you're not banging your head against the wall trying to figure out how technology can work for you in the classroom. So we want to be there to assist with any integrations or any of the customizations. So again, you can contact your sales representative. If you go to our website, jblearning.com, and you select the Contact Us link at the top of the page, you'll then be able to request access to your sales representative where they can set you up with this online demo. Those are the, the main features and functionalities that we have in Navigate 2. Again, it offers a lot of other opportunities to flip the classroom, and we'd love to share that with you. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn the control back over to Jen for some additional information. Excellent. Thanks so much, Courtney, for that in-depth overview of the Premier Access Package. And if you would like more information, we'll give you some tips on how you can do that. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat feature. We do have a few more minutes left before we reach the top of the hour, and you know we're happy to take any questions that you might have. So if you would like to request a review copy or if you would like more information on Navigate, we have two URLs that you can visit. Tammy has graciously left her email address there if you have any questions for her. So Becky, do we have any questions from our audience today? Uh, no, we do not have any questions. Okay. Tammy Lee, I think you did such a great job with the content, and Courtney, you gave just such a really thorough uh, demonstration. We also didn't receive any questions via the chat, so I want to thank both of you for your time today. I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day to hear more about this textbook and a little bit more about our digital resources. That concludes our presentation, and I want to thank you again. Have a great day, everyone.